My father came from Rovne Gebernie. But now I'm here, I'm dancing a tango. Die, 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 I am easily assimilated. I am so easily assimilated. I never learned a human language. My father spoke a high middle Polish. In one half hour, I'm talking in Spanish. Por favor, torredor, I am easily assimilated. I am so easily assimilated. It's easy, it's ever so easy. I'm Spanish, I'm suddenly Spanish. And you must be Spanish too. Do like the natives do these days. You have to be in the majority to Slavios Ruby. Oh, yes, I really know whereof I speak when I speak about assimilation. That song could have been written for me. It was not so difficult for a child to assimilate. We, I was really very young when it all happened, when Hitler came to power. We fled. I, f I fled to France and, and, and then to England. And uh, I could speak no English, I remember. But evidently, whatever I was able to say, I could say like I say it today. And I will never forget walking down the streets in London trying to find this place. I had the address written down in my hand. And I walked up to a policeman. He's your friend in England, you know that. I walked up to him and said, I'm sorry, sir, but I can't speak English. And he was very tall, and he looked down at me very kindly. And he said, oh, can't you, ducky? <laughs> my introduction to British humor. He took me by the hand and led me to, to the address clutched in my hand, which was the Bloomsbury House, which was a sort of clearing place for people like us who had nothing. We had only what we brought with us on our backs. We had no money. We had no home. <coughs> Excuse me. And the British are kind on their own soil anyway and try to get us homes and jobs. And <coughs> But British red tape is the best developed in the whole wide world. And there we sat for weeks, waiting our turn. And the tension in the room was visible, particularly amongst the older people. As I said, it wasn't so terrible for me. But my parents were very anxious. And this man, who I will never forget if I live to be 100, he was very elegant. He had beautiful white hair, and he was very dignified. And evidently, he had learned how to speak English. But he didn't quite know how to use the language. But we saw him get up enough courage. And he walked up to the man who was guarding the door. And he walked up to him and said, excuse me, sir, but I was here tomorrow. And the man who was guarding the door was Cockney, who said, sorry, mate, but you'll just have to come back yesterday. <laughs> and the ice was broken. And it was, I learned so early on that with humor, you can survive a lot of things. And you needed a lot of humor to survive that period, as you always do. And then, of course, the inevitable war broke out, uh, the war that had to be fought. Hitler had to be fought. And the British were in a panic. I mean, there was all this influx of refugees from everywhere. And they were not really prepared for the war. And so they interned people like us. And they sent us to the Isle of Man. And as I said before, they treated us very, very well, decently. 
I actually was not interned. I was sent away to evacuation. I was young enough to go to be sent away from the bombs, and I was beginning to be quite happy somewhere in Hertfordshire, I think it was. But my parents were interned, and the big fear during the war was separation. And in fact, the young man I subsequently married was interned in Canada behind barbed wire. We were free on the Isle of Man, more or less, but the fear of separation was so extraordinary that my mother took me out of school and said she will be with us. And I went to the Isle of Man. It's a very long story because it was 1940, and it was, there was an enormous attack on Liverpool. And I remember when I was, I was this little girl in an air raid shelter. Liverpool was laid low that night. I was traveling alone with the children transport. No, my parents were already in the internment camp. And I was terrified. The bombing was extraordinary. And what I did was I took the little children and started to sing with them, any kind of folk song I knew. And I forgot to be as scared as I was. Very early on, my singing has always meant making people feel better, making them love me, making f myself forget how frightened I was, you see. and. Uh, we survived that night, and then I was with my parents. <coughs> Excuse me. And then the opening of the camp. Again, you see the British are very civilized, and they had a festival. They had a festivity, and they went around saying, well, who can do anything? And my mother said, my daughter sang before she spoke. <laughs> so I got up there, and I sang the popular songs of the day, and a Yiddish folk song, and a German folk song, and a French folk song, anything that I knew, and I was a great success. And the camp commander afterwards came up to me and said, are you going to make the stage your career? <laughs> you know, that's so British too, right? Here we are, penniless, interned, and he's thinking about career, but I think of him rather often and with great warmth. I have indeed made the stage my career. And what happened in the internment camp, which was psychologically sometimes quite damaging for me. I mean, I had a, a long time of struggle to get out of that feeling of being an enemy alien. We were cleared after two years that we were a friendly alien, you see. But my life really began there, my performing life. I, there was an inspiration which, for which I am endlessly grateful, and that was a woman came from Iceland to entertain us. Her name was Engelund. She was a very extraordinary artist. She was a folk singer, not a folk singer like we understand it in America with a guitar and, and shoeless troubadour. But she sang songs accompanied by the piano, and she stood very tall and very, very severe-looking woman, but with an enormous sense of humor and and humanity. And she called her program Songs of Many Lands. And I, I was now 14, 13, going on 14. And she sang. She began her program with saying, this, this is a song about a little girl who's bringing blueberries for her mother, but before she comes home, the basket is empty. And everyone in the audience is crying. And she hadn't said anything sad, but we were in a very vulnerable state, you know. We were isolated from the world, and this woman brought the world into this isolation. And she sang in, in Scandinavian languages, of course, and in French, and in German, and suddenly I thought I was going to pass out, because I hear this obviously not Jewish woman say, this next song was taught to me by a Jewish tailor in Denmark. And she proceeds to sing a song my grandfather used to sing. Ayai de Rebegate, Ayai de Rebegate. Well, I, I don't know if you can imagine what that was like. In 1941, when we had been thrown out of our country for being Jews, if you spoke Yiddish, you spoke it softly. If you sang Yiddish songs, you sang it around your table or a fireplace if you had one. You never shared that with the, with the outside world in those days. Here is this Danish artist singing my grandfather's song identifying it to the whole world. Well, I cried from the beginning of that program to the end, and I was unable to, to speak to her afterwards. But some flash went through my head that said, if you survive all this, 
you are going to do what this woman does. Uh, I, it was a flash and it went away and I, when I was released, now this is 1942, I was released from the camp and I went to look for her. And I found her quite easily. She was a very accessible person and I sang for her. And I talked to her about my life and what I want to do in the world and she said, it's enviable, you never had to learn these songs. You, they were given to you. <laughs> I was so stunned by this humanity of this person. And this is in the middle of the war. She gave me a letter that said, to whom it may concern. We have heard, uh, in those days, my name was Haftel. Schlamme is a married name. We have heard Martha Haftel sing, and we believe that she deserves first-rate training and this is in the middle of the war, and I, I was sent to Emmy Heim, and I got singing lessons. I got piano lessons from her accompanist, Ferdinand Rauter, and they got me a piano. I mean, it's really a miracle, and my life began. I called my programs, when I came to America finally, I called my first program Songs of Many Lands, and my first album was called Songs of Many Lands. And it, you know, people are often saying, I, how, how, how did I not become bitter? Well, I had a right to become bitter. I turned it down because predominantly I'm a survivor and I was shown enormous kindness. And my faith in humanity is always rewarded. I mean, I know how rotten people can be and I know how rotten the world is, but I'm hanging in there and I'm saying it is really worthwhile. I was young, just 16, when you came from Burma and asked me to go with you. You didn't say you were a sailor. You said you worked at the railroad. You said many things, Johnny. Not one word was true. I hate you. You just stand there grinning. You didn't want love. You wanted money. I gave you everything you wanted more. You have no heart, Johnny. And now you are leaving. I don't know why. I don't know where. And oh my God, I love you so. Ich war jung, Gott, erst 16 Jahre. Du kamest von Burma herauf. Du sagtest, ich solle mit dir gehen. I first met Martha Schlama in the fall of 1976. I was attending Adelphi University in Garden City, New York, that's sort of uh, the uh, first part of Long Island in a way. And I was uh, studying in a very um, intense theater conservatory atmosphere. We were going to uh, do the play Three Penny Opera that fall at Adelphi, and the head of the school, Jacques Burdick, he had his friend Martha Schlama come by to coach us on singing Kurt Weill music. Well, I took to her right away, and I was impressed that she really was combining acting technique with singing a song, and that would influence me forevermore after that. I never intended to continue being friends with her, or even a fan of her, and at this time I really had not even known about her previous history singing Yiddish folk songs. Um, quite a recording career in her younger days. I had no idea about that. Um, I know that I then, in the fall of 1977, I, uh, I went to London, and it must have been in the spring of 1977, before I went to London, that I saw her up at Yale. She was performing in a small place on campus, and it might have been Alvin Epstein, Epstein with her, and they were performing the Kurt Weill Cabaret. It was great. It was fantastic. And I, again, I saw it in the village in a small cabaret space, and I can't recall. It must have been around those years, maybe when I got back from London, uh, the year after that in 1978. And then I finally saw Martha at Ravinia. I moved to Chicago in 19... 79 and have stayed here since then acting and 
and doing whatever jobs I can to stay alive. But um, I went to see Martha at Ravinia, and it was great. She, again, she did the Kurt Weill Cabaret. And I remember afterwards, um, when you're, you know, I'm, we're waiting around near the dressing room of Martha um, after the performance. A lot of people have gathered. There might have been, a re there, there was, a reception room to meet her. And I remember I was at the far side of the room, and she entered the door to the room at the other far side of the room. And she, across the way, said, Frank. She recognized me, and the people uh, in the room parted ways, and she came through. We met and hugged. And I was just so impressed and delighted that she remembered me, uh, that after her performance she would um, want to speak with me. And she thought of me as her student, I think, and I was honored to be considered her student. And so I put this video together of um, material I've had of hers. Um, after she passed away, I did a one-night performance with a company I started called the Temporary Theater Company. And one night we did a show, When I Have Fears, and uh, which is based on a poem by John Keats. But a lot of uh, different performance pieces were part of this show. Performers did a variety of things based on that theme. And when audiences came to the show, they saw a video of uh, Martha talking, the video that you've seen already with her, what I call a conversation with Martha. And so she was part of that show, and she lives on for me in my memory of her and her contributions to how I work as an artist.